you everybody for joining us. Uh, welcome. Um, I see kind of some, some uh, familiar faces and I saw that in the chat. Uh, Loretta is posting, you know, hello from Beaverton. So we've tried to circulate uh, this information for this webinar across most of the region. So it's really nice to, you know, be able to bring uh, various agencies and organizations and support groups together uh, from across Ontario that are doing very important work to, to support migrant workers. Um, I know that this is a busy time, so a lot of uh, people also identified that they couldn't make it today, but we are recording uh, the webinar. Um, and we've also had some questions sent to us before ahead of time as well. Um, but we'll definitely send out the recording to you so you can share with your colleagues and uh, and we hope that the conversation um, on, you know, on important topics will, will continue after as well. Uh, so my name is Eduardo Huesca. Uh, I will be helping facilitate uh, the webinar today. I work for the Occupational Health Clinics for Ontario Workers. Uh, we are a network of occupational health clinics distributed throughout uh, the province. And uh, our aim is to promote and support the, so uh, the social, uh, mental and physical well-being of Ontario workers. So I myself coordinate OCAL's Migrant Farmer Group Program uh, together with uh, some of my colleagues. We're a very small team, but uh, since 2006, we've been focusing on trying to really understand the health and safety uh, needs uh, of, of migrant workers or temporary foreign workers or international uh, work or farm workers. Um, and in understanding and working directly with communities, uh, we've, you know, put together information, developed intervention projects, including um, occupational health clinics, workshops, um, and, uh, and additional supports. So we've worked pretty direct with farm worker communities throughout most of the, of the regions um, and with a lot of you. Uh, and we work a lot with uh, community groups, service, uh, service agencies, as well as employers as well. Um, so today we have organized uh, this webinar and we've invited Ron Landry uh, from the Ministry of Labour, Training and Skills Development uh, to share information regarding the ministry's uh, second COVID-19 inspection initiative. Uh, so this initiative is focusing on visiting and inspecting agricultural workplaces uh, to, uh, you know, assure compliance to COVID-19 safety measures. Uh, so this information has already been presented to employers um, as part of continuing to make you know, to make them uh, or to have clarity among <clears throat> them around uh, uh, what they, you know, have to have in place in terms of COVID-19 safety. Uh, but for us, it was also really important to have, you know, community and service agencies also be aware of this initiative, um, you know, understand it, understand what the ministry is doing and have the opportunity to ask questions, um, you know, clarify information and, and potentially also provide some feedback. Um, so that's, you know, the goal of today. Um, I, so in terms of kind of a bit of, of what we're going to uh, do, uh, we're going to have uh, Ron uh, present. Um, and so it's, we're going to go through all his presentation. Um, and while he's presenting, uh, we're welcoming, you know, questions to be put into the chat box. And I'm going to be trying to facilitate and, uh, and uh, uh, organize those. And so uh, we're, we are wanting to hold the questions until the end, um, and then we'll, we'll start answering the questions. Um, and we'll see how many participants um, end up being involved. We, we were worried that the number would be large. So, you know, we were going to just do um, the, the questions out of the chat box uh, for now. Um, and uh, after, you know, questions, we were going to just review a little bit of some resources that OCAO, our program, has, has put together around COVID-19 for farm workers. Um, we've sent them out, but just in case uh, anybody is not, is not aware of that. I want to thank... Uh, Ron for, for coming um, and for joining us today. So Ron Landry is the Acting Senior Manager for the Ministry of Labour, uh, Training and Skills Development. Um, he's the uh, Industrial Health and Safety Program uh, uh, Manager. And so he's coordinating this, this inspection initiative. Uh, so I'll pass it all over to you, Ron. And Thank you, Eduardo. Um, yeah, so my name is Ron Landry uh, with the Ministry of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Uh, I've been with the ministry since uh, 2004. Uh, when I joined the ministry as an industrial health and safety inspector in what was then called the high risk initiative. Um, I've held positions with the ministry in various roles, including regional program coordinator, regional program manager, policy advisor, provincial specialist, and now as the acting manager of the uh, acting senior manager of the industrial health and safety program. Um, I have a team of nine provincial specialists that report to me um, and what we do. One of the uh, big pieces of what we do is we provide advice on the interpretation and application of specific sections of the act or its regulations 
uh, in support of our operations field staff, so our inspectors, uh, when they're dealing with issues that have province-wide implications. And we also provide advice and guidance to the minister's office on matters regarding uh, worker health and safety. Uh, prior to working for the Ministry of Labor, I worked 15 years in the automotive manufacturing sector uh, for three prominent uh, manufacturers in that sector. Um, so again, uh, I'm going to run through the Temporary Foreign Agriculture Workers Initiative that we're running for 2021. Um, so of course, I'm going to be going through the presentation. Uh, it doesn't. The presentation itself does not replace the Occupational Health and Safety Act and its regulations, and should not be used as or considered to be legal advice. And our health and safety inspectors apply the law based on the facts in the workplace. And it is the responsibility of the workplace parties to assure compliance with the legislation. So this document does not constitute legal advice. So the 2021 Farming Initiative, uh, so beginning mid-January, so we've already started, uh, Ministry of Labor Training and Skills Development uh, will be conducting proactive workplace inspections, focusing on workplaces that employ temporary foreign agriculture workers across the province. The intent of this initiative is to help stop the spread of COVID in the workplace and the surrounding communities. And this province-wide initiative will focus on workplaces in the farming and agricultural sectors where temporary foreign agriculture workers are known to work. So in 2020, the federal government approved over 650 farms in Ontario to receive 10 or more temporary foreign workers. Ontario received approximately 20,500 workers through the Temporary Foreign Workers Program, including approximately 17,000 workers through the Seasonal Agriculture Workers Program and 3,500 workers through other substreams of the Temporary Foreign Workers Program. And according to the COVID website, as of December 21st, 2020, over 1,650 temporary foreign agricultural workers are reported to have tested positive for COVID. So we ran a Temporary Foreign Agricultural Workers Initiative in the farming sector from April 21st to December 21st, 2020. In that time, we received 139 COVID-related complaints regarding the farming operations. Our inspectors conducted 950 field visits to 710 agricultural and farming operations, impacting approximately 29,000 workers in the agricultural and farming sector. So a huge impact, you know, a huge, a huge connection, 29,000 workers. These inspections also uncovered a significant underground economy, economy component relating to the use of temporary help agencies. And as a result, Ministry of Labor Training and Skills Development also undertook an in innovative information collection approach to measure temporary help agency usage in the farming industry. So we started gathering a lot of information on temporary help agencies that were out there and uh, focusing on them. Um, you know, and part of that focus, uh, our employment standards side of, of the uh, ministry uh, focused their attention on the temporary help agencies as well last year, and we'll continue to do so this year. Uh, but information gathered in last year's initiative uh, did result in employment standards orders uh, to pay in excess of one and a half million dollars in wages. It's obviously proven that there is need for attention in this area, and we will continue to do so uh, in this year's initiative. Recently, Ontario has experienced new positive cases and outbreaks on farms in some areas. And as part of Ontario's outbreak management response, Ministry of Labor Training and Skills Development will continue to conduct targeted inspections in 2021. The initiative aims to raise awareness, raise awareness and compliance among farm workers, supervisors, and employers about COVID health and safety requirements to enhance protection for temporary foreign agriculture workers living and working on farming and agricultural operations in the province, to increase compliance with the Occupational Health and Safety Act and applicable regulations in the farming community, and to help stop the spread of COVID in the workplace and the surrounding community. So inspectors will be conducting proactive occupational health and safety visits to farms, greenhouses, and other locations where agriculture workers work with a specific focus on operations employing temporary foreign workers. When conducting these farm inspections, inspectors will also inquire about the farm's use of temporary health agencies and complete a temporary help agency underground economy questionnaire, which will help to facilitate further action taken by other programs and agencies. So uh, I will be discussing later in the presentation where we are sharing information with other agencies to try and coordinate activities in the field. 
The Ministry of Labor and Training and Skills Development is currently using the existing general duties on Section or 252H of the Occupational Health and Safety Act to require employers to take every precaution reasonable in the circumstance for the protection of a worker from COVID. So this includes a focus on screening to prevent workers who may have COVID from coming to work, physical distancing, a two meter separation between workers, proper on-site hygiene, such as cleaning common touch surfaces, and engineering controls, as well as other precautions, including the use of personal protective equipment. And we also employ a team of specialists uh, at the Ministry of Labor Training and Skills Development who may accompany inspector to provide additional expertise. These professionals include engineers, industrial hygienists, doctors, ergonomists, and radiation experts. They may also bring or make referrals to Service Canada and or the local public health unit as deemed appropriate in the particular circumstance. So the role of an inspector is to enforce the Occupational Health and Safety Act and they do so by inspecting provincially regulated workplaces, investigating complaints, work refusals, fatalities, and critical incidents, issuing orders for non-compliance with the Act and its regulations, promoting the internal responsibility system, which means you know all workplace parties are engaged in keeping the workplace safe. So it's not just the employer, the supervisor, or the worker, it's everyone working together to promote health and safety in the workplace. And also to help address issues related to the pandemic, our inspectors have also been authorized to enforce orders made under the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act, or EMCPA, and the Reopening of Terror Act 2020, or ROA. The Ministry of Labor, Training, and Skills Development understands the important role biosecurity plays in preventing the transfer of disease and pest infestation between farming operations. To minimize the possibility of spreading, spreading biological hazards during field visits, Inspectors are required to follow biosecurity protocol as directed by the Ministry's Internal Policy and Procedures Manual. Inspectors are also asked to observe and respect all biosecurity signage on farms, and regions are asked to ensure that the inspectors have access to complete and updated biosecurity kits. I just want to mention the biosecurity protocols and the policies and procedures that we have in place have always been in place, uh, so this is, isn't new uh, due to the pandemic. Um, but we are assuring folks that we are taking the necessary steps to ensure that our inspectors are not vectors for transmission of disease from farm to farm. So these inspections are on a, typically unannounced, uh, but an inspector may call uh, as part of their discretion, they may call in advance uh, to see whether or not there are any specific biosecurity uh, concerns going on at the particular farm at the time or, or a COVID outbreak. This could be, you know, uh, this call could happen, you know, they could be in the parking lot when they make this call, they could be on their way. Um, so it's not like, you know, they'd be given a week's notice that they're going to be inspected on a particular day. It's just at the discretion of the inspector, um, because we, um, you know, our inspectors, at the end of the day, they are workers in Ontario, just like any other worker in, in Ontario, and they have the same health and safety rights and obligations as any other worker in the province. Our inspectors will be conducting an administrative and physical inspection of the workplace and will use their discretion to select errors within each workplace to inspect. Some of the errors that will be a focus, uh, staff break errors, including outside break errors in lunchrooms. Uh, this is one area of concern as we've gone through the pandemic that we found, you know, while many work, and this is not unique to farming, but many workplaces, uh, while they have great uh, policies, procedures, practices in place, for getting into the workplace and conducting the work, an area that perhaps may not have been a primary area of focus is when folks are taking their breaks and lunches, and this has been a vector for spreading of COVID. Uh, also looking at production and packaging, office areas, storage, warehouse, and distribution areas, greenhouses, and in the field. And of course, our inspectors are encouraged to explore all areas of the facility and speak to workers wherever possible to verify that COVID measures are in place and being implemented. Each region is going to be identifying workplaces to visit based on the Occupational Health and Safety Branch's list of priority farming operations to be inspected. And this list will be based on a review of available data from the federal government and on the following Ministry of Labor Training Skills Development information. Previous occupational health and safety events, including previous complaints, previous outbreaks or notices of occupational illness, and prior COVID-related orders being issued operations known to use contract workers through the temporary help agencies and operations with 20 or more uh, temporary foreign workers. 
also relying on field intelligence, so previous field visit operations, on-site and off-site housing, and referrals from our partner agencies. So there is an information sharing agreement between Service Canada and the Ministry of Labour, Training and Skills Development, which is designed to allow our ministry to receive information related to worker health and safety, uh, which are identified by our respective inspection staff. As well, managers and inspectors receiving such reports are asked to consider them to be a priority with respect to response. And of course, it's a reciprocal arrangement. So we are sharing information with these other agencies as well. And we, when we provide such information, uh, they receive priority response as part of this ongoing work and collaboration. So while attending a workplace to conduct an inspection of the Occupational Health and Safety Act, if an inspector identifies health and safety concerns related to bunkhouses or other employer provided living accommodations that do not fall under the jurisdiction of the Ministry of Labor, Training, Skills Development, inspectors will be discussing this with their manager or regional program coordinator about sharing concerns with Service Canada the local public health unit or other applicable authorities to determine if a consultation, referral, or joint visit is appropriate. So the act and the regulation does not give inspectors uh, the powers to address concerns within the bunkhouses that are considered uh, private residences. Uh, however, if we are aware of concerns with these areas, uh, we will make the appropriate referrals to have them addressed. Of course, anyone who suspects misuse or abuse of temporary foreign worker program workers uh, can report uh, toll free to uh, Service Canada's tip line at 1-866-602-9448. Human trafficking uh, involves the recruitment, transportation, harboring and or exercising control, direction or influence over the movements of a person in order to exploit that person through forced labor. For an inspector, when exercising their functions on the Occupational Health and Safety Act, observes or has reason to suspect human trafficking, the inspector will follow the Ministry of Labour Training and Skills Development Policies and Procedures Manual and advise the manager and discuss next steps, which may include calling the police and or the Canadian Human Trafficking Hotline at 1-833-900-1010. Um, again, the human trafficking component and uh, being aware of the uh, potential signs and symptoms uh, has been in place uh, for our field operations uh, for for uh, quite some time now, many number of years, uh, so it's not unique to COVID, but it is part of our inspection process to be aware of these things. Under the Occupational Health and Safety Act uh, and its regulations, employers have obligations to protect workers from hazards in the workplace, including infectious disease. Key duties under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, employers must ensure workers know about hazards and dangers by providing information, instruction, and supervision on how to work safely. You have to ensure supervisors know what is required to protect worker health and safety on the job, to create workplace health and safety policies and procedures, and ensure everyone follows the law and the workplace health and safety policies and procedures, to ensure workers wear and use the right protective equipment, to do everything reasonable in the circumstance to protect the worker's health and safety. So what to do if a worker tests positive for COVID? The Occupational Health and Safety Act 52.2 if an employer is advised that a worker has an occupational illness due to an exposure at the workplace or that a claim has been filed with a workplace safety and insurance board, the employer is required to notify the ministry in writing within four days. So it's important to note there are two different triggers. One is uh, a worker has an occupational illness due to an exposure at the workplace or that a claim has been filed with WSAB for an occupational illness. So if, uh, if you become aware that, that one of your uh, workers has filed a claim with WSIB, regardless of uh, proof of where the exposure came from, uh, if, they've, if they've submitted a claim for OCK illness, it, it does trigger this notification. If you have questions or would like to report an occupational illness, you can do so at the Occupational Health and Safety Contact Center at the number provided. You can also send in an OCK illness notice to the email address provided at the bottom of the slide. So uh, throughout the pandemic, our call center has been extremely busy. Uh, we've increased resources and staffing the call center to address this demand. However, there are times when there is a wait period to get through. If what you are trying to do is sending an OCK illness, uh, you may find uh, the most effective way to do so is through the email address provided. There are penalties uh, in the legislation for non-compliance uh, under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, the maximum penalty for an individual 
uh, found guilty of an offense is liable to a fine of up to $100,000 or 12 months imprisonment or both, and a corporation liable to a fine of up to $1.5 million. And of course, any decisions of an inspector can be appealed to the Ontario Labor Relations Board. So this is back to the original field visit and orders issued or not issued. Uh, the prosecution part is obviously through the courts. And there are uh, penalties established as well under the legislation for the MCPA and ROA. Uh, the maximum penalty is one year imprisonment or a fine up to $100,000 for an individual, $500,000 for a director of a corporation, $10 million for a corporation itself. And there are also set fines or what folks typically refer to as tickets, uh, ranging from $750 to $1,000. Uh, these can be issued to, you know, any workplace party that can be issued to members of the public um, under this legislation of the EMCPA and the ROA. So it's important to note that inspectors enforce applicable legislation uh, based on the facts as determined at the time of the field visit. We have our Occupational Health and Safety Contact Center, uh, which you can call anytime to report critical injuries, fatalities, or work refusals. You can also call 835 Monday to Friday for general inquiries, including COVID inquiries. Uh, the number provided. You can also email questions to the WebOSH address provided and you will receive a response uh, within five business days. In an emergency situation, always call 911. The number of printable posters available, uh, surgical masks versus N95 respirator, how to self-isolate, how to self-monitor, cleaning and disinfecting for public settings, Public Health Ontario's how-to hand wash poster, and Public Health Ontario multilingual how-to posters. Well, a number of online resources, uh, agricultural health and safety during COVID, available in English, Spanish, and Thai, farming operations, hiring contract workers, working with farm operators, to, farm operators to stop the spread of COVID, WSAB, Foreign Agricultural Workers Program, Ministry of Health Guidance for Congregate Living, and Ministry of Health COVID guidance on farm outbreak management. As well, an excellent resource. Uh, this is relatively hot off the presses. Uh, the COVID-19 Agriculture Resource Library. So this new library can uh, includes an extensive list of resources, guidelines, posters, videos, etc., to help support farm employers and international farm workers in a variety of language. So this is really your, your one-stop shopping. Excellent resource and a, a link provided. That brings me to the end of my part of the presentation. I can open it up to questions now. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, we have we have a couple questions in the box and feel free everybody else to add more, but we can start with these for now. Um, so the first question is, will, and I guess you, you touched on this a bit, but will employers be notified in advance about the inspections? Typically there are unannounced inspections. Uh, as I mentioned in the presentation, the inspector may reach out, you know, um, even they could be in the parking lot saying they're about to come in and, you know, are there any outbreaks that they need to be aware of or any uh, biosecurity concerns. Um, so typically proactive spe inspections are not uh, not announced, uh, but the inspector does have that discretion. The other question is, is the MOL given addresses for any temporary foreign worker housing? If so, can that information be shared? No, we're not provided with that list of information. Um, another question, does the information sharing agreement with Service Canada include the federal inspection program for temporary foreign workers? So we are working with the federal government, uh, sharing information, trying to coordinate our inspections as well. Um, so the inspectors have the power to be accompanied by anyone uh, they choose uh, for the purpose of their inspection process, so they can bring a federal counterpart with them. Um, part of this coordinated activity and sharing of information is um, trying to coordinate the inspection process. So one of the issues that uh, we have heard in the past, you know, some of the farming operations, you know, say for example, the, the federal inspector shows up today, tomorrow the provincial inspector shows up, you know, and, and so it, it's, uh, you know, we're trying to minimize the impact on, on the uh, farming operations. And, and we're also trying to coordinate our activities so that our resources are going where they need to be. Another question here is, um, what is so um, folks were asking what is the telephone number to report or request an inspection uh, visit you shared the the contact center number but is that then um that number that yes yeah, so our, our our contact center would be the number to call um you know if you want to uh register a complaint about the uh, workplace health and safety 
um, you know, after trying to resolve it internally, typically is, is the way that process would work. Um, or, you know, we do have folks that uh, proactively would like to have an inspection um, to make sure that everything that they have is meeting the requirements. But that would be through our call center. And Ron, is that call center accessible? Is there a language translation services for that, for that number in terms of, um, you know, facilitating workers calling? Um, obviously, some, you know, usually it's, it also would be in, you know, in support of, of, uh, of other groups also calling um, for workers, but would workers have that access to language translation through that call center? Once they get through to an agent, they can ask for service in other languages. And I know there's there's resources circulating around the call center and how to make it more accessible to workers that that do describe to workers, you know, to wait, um, you know, uh, that they're going to be connected to an automated message. There is information about what to press when you get to that point and then, you know, to wait. And as soon as you hear from a, a live agent uh, to request for um, for language assistance. So I yeah. know a lot of the community groups have been circulating uh, those materials as well. Okay, there's another question here. Um, so what's the process for ensuring employees are aware of health and safety standards for their workplace? I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that. Uh, you know, under the uh, Occupational Health and Safety Act, the employer has to provide them with the uh, information on all the hazards in the workplace and how to work with them safely. So the same would be for communicating your COVID uh, controls uh, in your suite of controls that you have in place to prevent the spread of COVID in the workplace, uh, as well as any uh, workplace that is operating under the uh, under the current lockdown. If your area is, is one of those, uh, then you're required to have a safety plan in place as well, uh, which needs to be communicated to all the workers. So you, in, in how you communicate that, you know, you have to decide what, for your particular workplace what, what, what works best. Uh, which may include having to translate information or communicate information in their uh, first language. I guess this, yeah, this connects to, we've been hearing questions around that orientation or that safety orientation to be given to workers. Would, mm -hmm. would the inspection, maybe kind of trying to get at maybe what this person's asking, with, would the inspections check whether that orientation has taken place um, and whether, or, you know, in terms of that being a requirement? Yeah, so part of, you know, our, our regular inspection process, and this is unique to farming, it's part of a regular process, is engaging uh, workers individually and uh, verifying that they have received training and that they are knowledgeable on how to work safely in the workplace. You know, somebody else had sent us a bit of information or, or a question a bit related to that around whether um, the inspections were, were uh, ensuring that that orientation or that training was happening in worker languages or in ways that that we, you know, if workers, for example, have literacy issues, whether there was any kind of um, assessment of that orientation uh, training that is required around yeah. whether it's effective or. Yeah, so language barriers can be an issue. Um, you know, uh, we do have some inspectors that can speak other languages. Uh, there are, you know, translation services available uh, if need be. Um, but there are challenges, not only with language, but even culturally, uh, you know, we know that at the end of the day, you know, like some folks are not necessarily uh, comfortable speaking to quote unquote government officials. Um, but we also rely on our call center as well to get reports of issues and uh, other groups, even uh, some of the local church organizations, for example, will reach out uh, with information of concerns about the treatment of workers. Um, one thing that uh, I guess a misnomer that's out there uh, that I've heard quite often is people think that to call in a worker or a workplace complaint that you have to be a worker at that workplace. That's not the case. Um, anybody can call in a worker, a workplace uh, concern regarding health and safety, for example, you know, separate and apart from farming. But, you know, if you go into a local store and you see a worker in there doing something unsafe, um, you can call and let us know about it and uh, and we'll look into it. So you don't have to be a worker or a workplace party to call in a concern. Just let us know and uh, we'll take a look. Another, uh, and there's a couple, there's more questions in the, in the chat box, so I don't mean to, um, so we're gonna continue going through them and, and we have time, but connected to that, another question we had gotten before the time was around, I guess, concern that workers might have that reporting or even being part of an inspection could put them at, at risk um, or there are, you know, a fear for, for their, their employment or 
and you know generally how that is is pretty understood across um, across communities that 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 fear exists. So yeah. I'm just so in terms of would you maybe be able I know you know I don't know if a lot of folks are uh, familiar with anti reprisal protections, but does that all is that all you know involved are uh, connected to the way that the call center takes calls or if the inspector is connecting to workers? Yeah. Is that information provided to workers or? Yeah, so so a few things. So first off, the, the call center will take anonymous complaints. So if, if someone wishes to remain anonymous, uh, they can do so. Um, secondly, the Occupational Health and Safety Act prohibits reprisal uh, from the employer against workers uh, for working within the uh, within the uh, conditions of the Occupational Health and Safety Act and its, and its uh, regulations. So they can't intimidate or, or punish or even threaten to punish a worker for working within the Occupational Health and Safety Act and its regulations. Um, and again, a reprisal, if someone feels they've been reprised against, they can call it into the call center. Um, the role of the inspector in a reprisal complaint is not to determine whether or not the worker was actually reprised against. Uh, what the inspector will do is they'll look into any of the health and safety concerns around the complaint. And then if the worker wishes to pursue the actual reprisal piece and whether or not they were reprised against, um, that would be a decision of the entire Labor Relations Board, which is an arm's length division of the ministry. And they have the powers to order remedial action should they determine uh, that a worker was in fact reprised against. So the inspector can help facilitate moving this issue to the entire Labor Relations Board uh, if the worker wishes to pursue that option. Another question we have here is who's responsible for providing safety equipment to employees at the workplace? Example, safety glasses, et cetera. So the act is, uh, unless it's specifically prescribed in the act, um, the act is silent on who, who, who pays for the equipment, right? Um, so uh, in a lot of union shops, there's a collective agreements that determine who pays and, and how much, and sometimes they pay the entire thing. Um, uh, there were places, non-union shops, they, they just provide it, uh, just being a good corporate employer. Um, but letter of the law wise, uh, it can just be a condition of employment. So for, for example, if I was the employer, I could say, you know, okay, you know, I'm hiring you to work for me, um, but you have to have green patch safety shoes to work here. So make sure you have those when you come to work. They can do that. Um, many employers also will supply the personal protective equipment because that way they have control of exactly what it is. You always know what it is and you, you know the certain standard that you're going to get. Um, but it's, unless it's specifically prescribed, um, the act is silent on who pays. And if there's any more questions around that, uh, specifically, feel free anybody to, to, uh, to ask more. Um, so another question here is, as, as the COVID hazard is invisible, do inspectors have the expertise or guidance to assess risk with an airborne hazard aerosol transmission? So the, the precautions against COVID are, you know, droplet precautions. Um, so uh, what we are looking at, you know, is a hierarchy of controls. So, um, you know, you can't just jump the personal protective equipment on workers. You need to go through the hierarchy of controls. As with any hazard, you try and engineer it and you know, process, find different ways of eliminating the hazard. Uh, but specific to COVID, um, if you've gone through your hierarchy of controls and you still have a worker required to work within two meters of an unmasked person uh, without any other you know, barriers or anything like that in place, then minimum standard of protection for that worker would be eye protection and a procedure or a uh, surgical mask. Um, you know, For example, a cloth mask, in that circumstance, when you're within two meters of an unmasked person, is not acceptable. A cloth mask is not personal protective equipment. What it's essentially doing is uh, containing any droplets from your nose and mouth, um, and which can be an effective control if everyone's wearing this cloth mask and wearing it properly. Uh, but if they're not wearing it, again, it's just containing what you have, similar to coughing or sneezing into your elbow. It's not protecting you from what others have if they're not wearing a mask. Airborne transmission, you know, the aerosol. So, so we're talking drop of precautions and the minimum standard again was the eye protection and the surgical procedure mask. The only time you need something more is if you were involved in an aerosol generating procedure, uh, such as intubating a patient. Um, that's where you would be into uh, eye protection and uh, N95. Um, but I'm quite sure nobody in this call uh, would be in that situation of an aerosol generating 
uh, process. So what inspectors are looking for amongst the hierarchy of controls um, is droplet protection. So, you know, you're into, but in your hierarchy of controls, you know, you've got all these other layers of protection, such as screening workers, cleaning high touch surfaces, um, reporting uh, screening of workers, having a, them reporting any illnesses, and uh, taking every precaution reasonable in the circumstance for the protection of workers. Um, another question, will all farms be inspected or just random? We don't have the resources to inspect every farm. Uh, this is a province-wide initiative, uh, but we are targeting our inspections to those using temporary foreign agriculture workers and uh, as well as sharing information with the other agencies to try and put our resources where they'll where they where where they will have uh, the greatest impact. So we won't get to every farm, uh, highly unlikely, um, but we will get to as many as we can. Next question is asking about the Service Canada tip line, but I'm not sure if the person meant uh, the Ministry of Labour tip line. But we are also were so the question is 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 the Service Canada tip line anonymous? What is the process behind that once a tip is received? I'm not sure if, yeah, the question is, is uh, for the Service Canada tip line or the Ministry of Labour uh, tip line, but do you want to maybe touch on the Ministry of Labour part? Um, uh, so, uh, you know, I can't really comment on the, uh, on the, uh, the, the uh, federal tip line as to how they process things once they receive a complaint. Um, but I can say on the ministry side that, uh, yeah, once our call center gets a complaint, um, you know, Sometimes uh, they can uh, they provide uh, additional resource information to the caller, uh, but once that complaint is received and we do accept uh, anonymous complaints, um, it is assigned to the uh, region. Uh, we, so we, we typically have our region, our inspectors assigned by postal codes, and it is actioned accordingly in, in a you know in a triage approach. Obviously, uh, a uh, a critical or a fatality is obviously a higher priority than a complaint. Uh, but depending on the inspector's workload, uh, they will get to it. You know, we are very busy on the reactive side since the pandemic began. Um, so our proactive abilities are somewhat limited, uh, but they are focused primarily on the, uh, the initiatives that we have announced, including this uh, temporary foreign workers initiative. And on that, um, as far as I know, I, th I think the Service Canada tip line is anonymous, but I'm not sure again what, what the process is behind it, but um, there was a speaker from Service Canada that, that actually uh, joined Ron in the, the presentation that was provided to the employers, and we were hoping to have that person also present here, but they were not available. Um, however, I think we're going to try to see if we can get that Service Canada speaker who, talk, who would talk about uh, the Service Canada inspections in more detail. Um, so if folks are interested in that, we, we're going to try to make that happen and, uh, and, and send that out as another uh, webinar invite um, if there's interest. Another question is, why are the health units not included in coordination of inspections? We are, we are sharing uh, information with the local public health unit, so we are engaging them. Uh, you know, my apologies for that didn't come out clearly in the presentation, but uh, we are sharing information with the local public health units and trying to coordinate, again, activities and, and making referrals when you know, one agency or the other has the best tools to deal with a particular concern. The next question is a bit related to that, but it was, um, is there any communication collaboration between local health units and the Ministry of Labour in regards to farms that health units consider at risk after the initial inspection by health inspectors from health units? So, you know, just like, uh, you know, as I said previously, whoever has the best tools, we're making referrals back and forth um, to address the particular concerns, you know, for example, uh, as I mentioned before, in the in the accommodation side of things, uh, you know, we really don't have the tools to be able to deal with that or the authority. Um, so we'll make referrals accordingly to address those concerns. Another question, uh, do the inspectors educate each workplace around the need for competent supervision and health and safety reps for more than five workers? Part of our, our regular inspection process is, is a focus on the internal responsibility system. Uh, which includes training of workers and joint health and safety committee, health and safety representatives, um, things of, of that nature. Um, that's, a, that's a fundamental in the work that we do because really the key at the end of the day is, is supporting the internal responsibility system. So the, the role of the Ministry of Labor and Training Skills Development is not to, to go into a workplace and take it over. That's not their, our role. Our role is to support the internal responsibility system and provide enforcement action where necessary. But the key here is, you know, if your internal responsibility system is functioning and functioning properly, 
It is the greatest single level of worker health and safety protection that you can have, more so than what an inspector can do. You know, as an example, if an inspector attends a workplace and finds a contravention of the act or its regulations, they'll write an order for compliance. And the compliance with that order will be meeting the minimum standard as prescribed in, the, in that particular section of the act or the regulation. On the other hand, if the internal responsibility system, for example, the Joint Health and Safety Committee, uh, was to identify the same hazard, they can make recommendations to the employer that exceeds the minimum standard. And if everyone is in agreement, they move to that higher standard. So really the key to worker health and safety is a proper functioning internal responsibility system and meeting all the obligations uh, in, as prescribed under the Act and its regulations. And the next question, can you say more about the use of help, uh, temporary health aid, uh temporary help agency workers on farms and the underground economy in agriculture. Do you have data on how extensive these phenomenon, uh, phenomena are and their impact on OHS outcomes as well as wage theft? It's been quite a journey. Uh, it started, as I mentioned in the presentation last year, when we started gathering information on the temporary help agencies. Um, you know, it's it's been a challenge trying to find information and trying to locate these um, these agencies, um, you know, we, we found it very challenging last year, so that's why we started gathering specific information, sharing that information, and using it to target our uh, our response regarding the temporary health agencies. And it's it's really been kind of a uh, been kind of cyclical because you know with with the pandemic there was restrictions; it was hard to get workers uh, to the farms, and so farms were relying on other agencies to try and support staffing. You know, in some instances. And so they were going to some of these temporary help agencies or even to address peaks in demand throughout the season. And, um, you know, as we found, as we gather information, um, you know, there's there's the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? <laughs> but that's just the fact of the matter is. Um, so we're trying to focus our attention, get to the temporary help agencies of concern and trying to uh, bring them into compliance and, uh, you know, where necessary, take enforcement action. As I mentioned previously, uh, in our employment standards side, uh, we were able to, to recover uh, substantial wages for workers, and uh, that's why we're continuing to focus on it this year. Um, specific to data and reporting, you know, we don't really have any information that we can share at this point in time, um, but it is information that we will be evaluating to see if there is a correlation or a nexus between, you know, uh, certain agencies and certain health and safety outcomes in these particular workplaces. In the chat box, there was also some information about free legal advice at the Windsor Essex Bilingual Legal Clinic um, uh, that was posted there as well. It confirmed that the tip line to report abuse of temporary foreign worker programs, I'm, I'm assuming uh, speaking to the Service Canada one, is anonymous. Uh, another question, does the ministry involve the counselors or other worker representatives? We have um, actually it's been a busy week. I think it was earlier this week. Um, I did provide a presentation uh, on this initiative um, to the various consulates that are bringing workers into the country. Um, so, I, yeah, we do engage with them. Um, and various consulates have been vocal in uh, reaching out for information and in, uh, regarding worker safety and what, what the ministry is doing, uh, in particular in the, uh, in the first wave early on in the uh, pandemic, the Mexican consulate was perhaps one of the most vocal ones in advocating for the safety of workers in the province. So uh, we have engaged with them uh, throughout the pandemic, uh, but most recently uh, this week, we reached out to them specifically for this webinar. And again, a Q&A um, question is part of or Q&A portion is part of that to answer any concerns that they have or may have uh, regarding what the ministry does. And just sharing information on what we do uh, and just having that open and transparent communication with them. Uh, it was very well received and we had a lot of participation. Another question here is, um, in the spirit of transparency, have you considered making webinars such as this one available to farm supervisors and employees about health and safety standards in their language? You could reach, uh, your reach would certainly increase. And if everyone's participation is mandatory, then awareness is achieved. It's something we can look at. We we have done webinars in general, much like this one, um, throughout the pandemic, but um, we have not done anything in uh, specific languages uh, other than English. But um, yeah, we can take that into consideration. Thank you for that. Last year, uh, with the first inspection initiative, we were attempting to 
do something like that. Um, and I think it's great to hear from community groups in terms of the best way that that could be put together. So that could, you know, definitely be something that um, we can collaborate with um, just to obviously explore whether it would be pre-recorded and if and if workers or supervisors have questions, what is kind of a direct line to have those answered if it cannot be live or if it is live, you know, maybe during uh, work time, then how to facilitate that as well. Um, but that's a very good, uh, very good uh, point. Another uh, question here. Any reflections on the efficacy of joint health and safety committees and worker health and safety reps where large numbers of temporary foreign workers are employed? I think, you know, it, it flows back to the internal responsibility system. So, you know, if these are in place and functioning properly, it does have great impact on worker health and safety, you know, not only specific to farming operations, but in any, op any uh, workplace, um, you know, I can tell you just in my past experience as an inspector, um, it's one thing to have a joint health and safety committee in place, for example. It's another thing to have a joint health and safety committee in place that is properly supported and functioning accordingly. Um, you know, a window dressing joint health and safety committee is not going to work properly. It has to be properly supported. And, uh, you know, when it is in place and properly supported, it, it does provide the greatest level of protection for worker safety. Just to connect to that, because I think that was a question that we get asked as well is around um, you know, we get asked in terms of how to support employers and workplaces <clears throat> develop a well-functioning, you know, committee or, or the role yeah. of the rep. But in terms of the inspections, is there in, in, in the inspector's assessment of whether, you know, the IRS is, is functioning or, or whether there's a committee or a rep, is, is there any type of assessment around whether it is functioning properly or, or any of that? Is there, is that kind of within the the role of the inspector to assess? Yeah, as part of, you know, we always assess your internal responsibility system. So, you know, particularly to joint health and safety committees, uh, myself as an inspector, I would always make a point of, because um, uh, one of the responsibilities of the committee is, is maintaining minutes of their meetings. Um, so one of the things I would always ask to look at is, is, is these minutes from past meetings, you know, because they can really be a good uh, indicator of the function of joint health and safety committees. So are they, is it the same issues being dealt with? Um, you know, are issues being identified and addressed? Or is there issues that are just carrying on from meeting to meeting? In other words, you know, they've identified a particular hazard or made a recommendation and no one's responding or, you know, it's just not advancing the agenda of the, of the committee. So it's one of the tools that we can use um, to make that assessment, but also speaking to workplace parties and, uh, you know, understanding uh, what other companies, what is the company's safety policy and program and looking to see if it's actually, you know, coming to life in the workplace, if those practices are, are being carried out and that the workers understand the, pro, uh, the hazards associated, how to work with them safely, given the particular circumstance. There's a, another question that we had received before was about housing. Um, so I know that you mentioned that housing does not uh, get looked at from the Ministry of Labor. Um, but the question was that recognizing that WSI B does see the housing as an extension of the workplace, is there an interest in uh, MLTSD exploring that? And the question was noting, recognizing that uh, uh, communal living is, you know, a, a risk of con or a, a area of concern uh, for COVID-19. Yeah, so we do understand that it is an area of concern, um, but, you know, we have to operate within the four corners of our powers and jurisdictions under the uh, Occupational Health and Safety Act and its regulations. So those areas are considered uh, to be private res residences, um, so we don't have the authority uh, to go in there. But that said, if we become aware of issues, you know, around uh, the bunkhouses and, and, and other offsite accommodations, uh, we can make referrals to the in the, the uh, appropriate agency to address those concerns. So, you know, while we can't go there, we can still impact uh, correcting deficiencies in those areas uh, through partnership with our other agencies. Another question that just came in: um, Are there are are there inspections on farms that have temporary foreign workers working without a valid work permit or non-status? That would be a requirement that's outside of our mandate. Um, so we're just looking at worker safety for any of the workers working in provincially regulated uh, workplaces. 
Um, so regardless of their quote unquote status, um, they're all workers in Ontario as far as what the work that we do. So it, it would have no bearing on the work that we do. Yeah, I, I think that's an area that that some that some uh, folks that we've talked about are clear around that regardless of status, uh, provincial labor rights are, uh, you know, folks have provincial labor rights. Um, yeah. We've also in the past have gotten questions whether the Ministry of Labor uh, would ever enforce immigration law or would they, you know, collaborate with reporting um, precarious status workers? Yeah, we, we, we have no, no impact on that work at all. We're here to protect worker health and safety. The, the next question, there was a document in the presentation um, described as the one-stop shop of information related to the current topics. How do I access that, that copy? So I can actually um, put the link to that document and, and uh, here I'll, I can share my screen really quickly because we actually were going to um, uh, show a little bit more of that document just in, in case if it was something of interest to everybody. So maybe I'll do that now um, and there's not and then it'll also buy some time if anybody else has any more questions. And then when we come back to, we can uh, also open up the audio if anybody has, you know, if, if that is easier to ask questions, if, if somebody wants to ask questions or make any, you know, uh, you know final comments as well. As we're winding down, um, there's not a lot more uh, conversation or questions in the text box, but I'm going to share my screen and show a bit of that document uh, just uh, to, to show where you can access it. And if everybody's able to see my screen. Um, so this is our OCOW uh, web page. The document's also posted on the Ontario Fruit and Vegetable Growers web page too. Um, but here, and I'll, I'll, I'll just show you where it is, but then I'll send you the direct link as well. So uh, here is our Migrant Farmer Group Program uh, web page. We're, we're in the midst of organizing our, our web page a bit better, uh, but we have some information around temporary foreign agriculture workers and COVID-19 safety. Um, and again, we're always trying to add to these, but the document that was mentioned is here. Um, so it, it was just to give a bit of a background. Uh, it's coming out of a project that we've collaborated with the Ontario Fruit and Vegetable Growers Association. Um, and it's really looking at pulling together uh, the resources that are known, um, that, it, that we know of that, uh, that communicate health and safety topics related to COVID-19 safety. And uh, the project team has really focused on looking for accessible resources. So that's been a, a big gap that, that I think everybody's recognized that, you know, there's so much information out there being spread. A lot of it is obviously directed at employers, um, you know, echoing a lot that, that Ron has described today in terms of what they're, uh, you know, what they have to have in place. Um, but uh, less, you know, less resources seem to have been uh, made available that were easy to you to share with workers that were in languages that were in, in you know, formats that uh, were easy for them to uh, engage with. Um, so this document tried to pull together that. So in the document, we have this table of content uh, where you can, you know, find some of the topic or the topics that we've kind of flagged as as uh, important ones. Um, and then, you know, we have a little bit of information around also, if anybody identifies any resources that they don't see in this library, um, the project team is very open to uh, having anybody send us more resources. So we've already uh, been receiving uh, more resources to add to this library. And the idea is that this library is also going to be re, uh, re-edited or a new version of it, an updated version is going to be ready for April. Um, and also the project is also uh, focused on trying to identify any information gaps. So. If, if any of uh, in your work, you're finding that there's not a resource that really, you know, speaks to something that you find is important in terms of COVID-19 safety. Um, also, the project is really interested in having um, that identified to, to us. Um, and there's a budget to create new resources and collaborate with organizations and agencies to create new resources to try to fill those gaps. Um, and then, so I'll, I'll just stop there and I'll, send, I'll uh, share the, the link, but uh, um, here it's just kind of how to use it. We we did include a little bit of a text for employers to really talk about, you know, resources are are good, but you really have to have a very thoroughly thought out way you're actually going to provide uh, health and safety education to workers on the farm or other cultural work site to ensure that you know folks have the opportunity to ask questions. They have the opportunity to actually, you know, identify if there's concerns. So again, creating that two way communication with workers. So. Uh, which is so integral for COVID-19. Um, so we've created this to, to try to just, 
you know, uh, continue the conversation with employers around the importance of that. And then this is what the actual resource looks like. Um, it's, it's a little bit long and that was a bit of a concern, but here you'll be able to read the resource title, whether the source was a Canadian or, or Ontario source, um, and uh, the languages that's available, and here are the direct links uh, for you to click on, which would open up uh, the, the resource. So we've focused on English, Spanish, and Thai language resources, um, and with quite a, few, a lot less Thai resources available. Um, so that's something that we're working on uh, with really trying to uh, increase. Um, and, uh, and still, and I think one of our project team's uh, lead is, is on this call, but there's, you know, we had a conversation yesterday that there's still quite a few gaps in information for around COVID-19 that's accessible to workers. So, um, you know, there's still a lot of work to do in terms of just the information, uh, let alone, you know, the practices that are, that are all um, in place. But I'll, I'm going to um, share that link into the chat box as well. Um, and then we'll, we can continue and I'll check if there's any additional questions now there as well. But here's the link again. Yeah, and if anybody is interested in, in uh, engaging around information resources, uh, definitely please reach out. Another question here, there, there was mention of breaks, lunch rooms. Sorry, there was mention that breaks and lunch rooms have been shown to be vectors for spread. What is required to support worker, workers practice hand hygiene? if they are in the field and not returning to a lunch room? The employer needs to assess the hazards in that particular circumstance and, and take appropriate measures to protect the worker's health and safety. So, you know, if, if it's a matter of, of hand hygiene and separation before they, uh, eating their lunches, um, then the employer needs to assess that circumstance and put it into measures to ensure that that can be done uh, appropriately in the circumstance to prevent the spread of COVID. So it's going to be dependent on the particular circumstance. You know, I can't tell you exactly what to do, um, but you need to assess that to make sure that the proper measures, the appropriate measures are in place um, to protect them from the spread of COVID. For example, maybe around that, if an inspector were to go onto a farm and, you know, what, what would be able to maybe, would there be a flag to see an issue around this? So if they saw workers, you know, eating outside, yeah. Would that be a concern for an inspector to, to look into or? It would be a concern if they were within two meters of each other. Um, one of the, you know, some of the instances where we have found issues on farms with uh, break periods, um, some of the more egregious situations have been uh, just a bunch of people sitting together at a table and nobody wearing masks and they're eating their lunches, right? So they're right shoulder to shoulder. So that's, that's obviously unacceptable. Uh, in the circumstance. Question here, how do you assess competent supervision on farms in the context of the biohazard of SARS-CoV-2? With any workplace party, when we're assessing competence, it's, you know, through a series of questions, you know, what are, you know, usually it's, it's uh, you know, you could speak in general terms, at the discretion of the inspector, can you speak in general terms as to, you know, things like, you know, well, what are your rules around COVID? Can you explain them to me? And, and what do you do in these particular circumstances? Other times it'll be like, for example, you're looking at a particular practice that's going on and, you know, you can say to the supervisor, okay, so, you know, do you have any concerns with that practice? And what do you do when you have concerns with that practice? What, what is your, you know, do you have a corrective measure? Do you keep notes? Um, you know, how do you enforce the health and safety rules in, in the workplace? So the company's policies and procedures, how are they enforced? And, uh, you know, what do they do when they find incidents of non-compliance? So it's important as any supervisor, um, not only to keep notes of any uh, observations that they may have, but also to keep notes of what corrective measures they've taken. Um, so the employer has to ensure that the supervisors are competent, that they can recognize hazards in the workplace, and then they can address them accordingly. So it's being able to do everything reasonable in the circumstance for the protection of the worker. And it's gonna be very specific to any particular workplace. You know, I can tell you as, uh, as an inspector, my past experience, um, you know, one of the things that a lot of workplaces will do, and I'm not saying that this is wrong, but because someone's been there for a long time, they'll make them a supervisor because they were such a great worker. But a great worker does not necessarily translate to a great supervisor. You need to be able to bridge that transition uh, with appropriate training to ensure that they understand the duties of a supervisor 
um, as opposed to the duties of a worker. You know, they have different responsibilities, different obligations on the act and its regulations, and uh, they can be held different, uh, accountable to different standards, right? You know, a worker versus a supervisor versus an employer. You know, again, back to the internal responsibility system, everyone owns a piece of it, uh, but you have to make sure that everyone's trained to be able to carry out their roles in compliance with the act and its regulations. Um, so there's another question around, uh... So I guess connecting to the lunchroom and raising the issue whether or or noting that um, within the lunchroom and enclosed environments, you know, airborne risk, um, there's an airborne risk in terms of talking and eating while masks are off in an enclosed environment. A statement, but is there in terms of inspect, inspectors looking at in those enclosed spaces, is there you know, uh, something that they note in terms of mask wearing while, while uh, workers are within enclosed spaces like the lunchroom? So again, with, with being a lunchroom, just by the nature of eating your lunch, people are gonna have their masks off. So you have to have everything in place to ensure that they are not at risk of exposure to COVID. So that could be involving, you know, staggering lunch breaks, uh, moving lunch, uh, opening more lunch rooms uh, so that people can maintain that two meter separation eating their lunches. So it's going to be dependent on the particular circumstance, how you do that. Uh, we have a number of resources available on our website. You can engage in public health if you need assistance. You can engage the health and safety associations if you need assistance. So there's a lot of resources available, a lot of resources as well in the uh, presentation, which folks can use um, to help inform their decisions. I think we just have a couple more. Um, so who supplies hand sanitizer masks for the use in the workplace? The mask part, you know, I've already covered that the act sounds on who pays for it. Um, that can be other uh, indicate other factors that play into that, uh, just being good corporate citizens or uh, union or uh, agreements, uh, things of that nature. Um, but the hand sanitizer, cleaning supplies are uh, things that the employer uh, ensures is adequately supplied to the workplace um, to support their health and safety program. The other question I think is, so it's again, talking about private residents, is, uh, so, but I understand that the private residence uh, doesn't fall under the MOL. However, what is the ruling with wearing masks once they are inside those residents? So maybe once workers are inside those residences. Yeah, so again, those would be concerns. You know, the same precautions need to be in place, right? Because they're, they're still, uh, you know, potentially, uh, you know, there's still the potential of the spread of COVID. And we know that bunkhouses are one of the areas of concern. Um, so while I can appreciate that it is an area of concern, uh, we don't have the tools to deal with that. Uh, federal counterparts have some influence as well as public health to address those concerns. But yeah, cares and precautions uh, should be uh, communicated to the uh, to the workers on how to protect themselves in those particular scenarios. And this one is is a bit general, and I uh, in terms of of the question, but maybe it's. It's worth bringing up for sure. Um, how does the ministry ensure that there is a there, that there is compliance around meeting all the required health and safety training? Is there a centralized system in place? Not really sure on that. I'm not really mm -hmm. sure that I understand the question. Yeah. So I think maybe recognizing that there's so many areas of compliance. You know, how is that ensured? So, uh, you know, I'm assuming the through the inspections and and uh, you know the inspectors looking at all of the areas of compliance that would be. Um, you know, maybe how that is insured, but yeah, um, yeah if you have any yeah, more. we don't we don't have a, a reporting system for employers to report their compliance. We just have responding to complaints and also going out on our our field visits and and you know actual boots on the ground um, to see what's actually being uh, carried out in the workplace. So that's that's the way we confirm compliance. I think to answer that question for a person, I guess it's yeah, exactly that, and and through so you're saying through kind of call if if you know. Uh, reporting if, if something is not, and then through the proactive inspection to, to see as well what's, what's in you know, place. You concerns that way. And, and, you know, just, you know, as I mentioned before, you don't have to be a workplace party to call it in. Um, but if you are a workplace party and you have a health and safety concern, um, the first round is to address it within the workplace. So you know, the worker, if they have a health and safety concern, they should be reporting to the supervisor or employer and trying to address that concern internally. If it, it's only when that reaches an impasse um, that they should be calling the Ministry of Labor. Because again, it's you know the key is at the end of the day, the best protection is a properly functioning and supported internal responsibility system. Um, so we don't want to circumvent that by just you know if you have a concern, call the Ministry. No, you have to try and address it internally first.
unless it's something like, for example, violence harassment or, you know, the worker just wants to make an anonymous complaint. Uh, but typically things are turned on to the internal responsibility system first and uh, we get involved when it can't be resolved. Another question too, uh, on the on the slide, there was mention around potential fines. So fines for non-compliance and there was yep. information around fines that could actually be put to, to workers. Um, and so the question was around, uh, you know, if you could talk a bit more about, about that and whether, yep. um, you know, I guess the concern from the person is whether, you know, information is getting to workers to make them aware that potentially, you know, there would be fines if, and, and exactly what that would look like uh, at risk, sure. you know, so that workers are not getting fines. The mention in the work or in the presentation specific to fines uh, was regarding set fines on the EMPCA and the, on the uh, ROA. So these are specific fines that can be issued to anybody, not just a workplace party, they can be members of the public. Um, so we, you know, you hear a lot of media play on that. So that's, you know, I guess you could call, you could say new tickets um, that that have come out as a result of the pandemic. Um, prior to the pandemic, just under the Occupational Health and Safety Act and its regulations, there are uh, there is a schedule of offenses uh, for fines such as uh, not wearing a, a head protection appropriate in circumstance. So there are some set fines available. So ticketing. Um, has always been available on the health and safety side. Uh, ticketing is fairly new on the, um, as a result of the pandemic on the MPCA and the, and the ROA. Um, but I can tell you that ticketing, uh, as far as ticketing under e any of these uh, circumstances, um, particularly with workplace parties, that's the focus of today's conversation, is that it is one of the tools available to an inspector, right? So they could write a ticket, they could write an order, um, they, they have that discretion, um, but I can tell you in my own past experience as an inspector, um, you know, tickets are not, um, they're not just thrown out there, right? If you're going to issue a ticket to a worker per se, um, you know, you can issue them to the worker, you can issue them to the supervisor, you can issue them to the employer, but the key is in a particular circumstance is that you can have to consider the entire food chain. So everyone's responsibility, again, back to the internal responsibility system. So say, for example, if I'm an inspector and I, let's say I'm in a workplace and uh, I see a worker doing a job that they should have uh, safety glasses on and they're not wearing safety glasses. Well, that's not an automatic, you know, if, if uh, that wouldn't automatically uh, result in a ticket to the worker. It could, uh, but you have to consider the, the, to the totality of the circumstance. So I would have a discussion with that worker as to, uh, you know, do they understand the hazard of the job? And do they understand how to protect themselves from the hazard of the job? So do they know that they're supposed to wear safety glasses? Not that ignorance is a defense, but do they know? Has, has anyone explained it to them? And, uh, you know, do they have safety glasses available to them? And and why aren't they wearing safety glasses? So all these all these um, things get, call, uh, get called into play when making the dis a decision and where the inspector exercises their discretion. So once you're done evaluating the worker in that particular circumstance, again, back to the whole role and responsibility, who is your supervisor, right? And depending on what the supervisor has to say, again, you know, in a similar circumstance, do you know the hazards? Do you know the controls? Is the equipment available? Are you ensuring they're wearing it? Worker, you know, whereas the worker could get a ticket for not wearing safety glasses, the supervisor could also get a ticket for not ensuring the worker is wearing the safety glasses if that's the case. And again, if you're going to write a ticket to the supervisor, then the next question is going to be, okay, well, who do you report to? And you get to the employer. And again, depending on the circumstances, the employer could also receive a ticket for not ensuring that the supervisor is ensuring that the worker is wearing the safety equipment. So it, it has a domino effect potentially, uh, but the key is that we don't look at any individual workplace party in a vacuum. Uh, we look at the totality of the circumstance, not only in ticket writing, same in order writing. Right? It's looking at the totality of the circumstance and determining whether or not there is a contravention and taking corrective measures appropriate in the circumstance. Do inspectors ask to see basic awareness certification for all workers on site when they visit? Inspectors can ask for documentation, um, existing documentation for anything in the workplace that they choose to. Um, so they have that power to do so. Um, I would say at a regular practice, they don't, you know, they wouldn't go and ask to see the awareness training for every single worker unless 
they were responding to a complaint of that nature. But with any existing document in the workplace, whether it's a training document or perhaps a certification on a particular piece of equipment, uh, the inspector has the power to request uh, the document be provided uh, for their review. Question, is there information of the inspect, uh, inspected farms available to the public? So yeah, is there information of, of which farms were inspected available to the public? Um, I don't think that that detailed information is available. Um, there is information posted in publication from the ministry as far as number of field visits, number of orders. Um, but I think if, if uh, it's, that's about the detail of the information that's currently available. Last question. Uh, you mentioned this information was provided to employers. What are some of the challenges employers have identified? The like meaning like this presentation? Yeah, I think yeah. the person means, yeah, this presentation. If I, was to, if I was to kind of, one of the biggest concerns that we've had, and again, not just from, from the farming sector, but workplaces in general, is just trying to keep up with the changes, right? And, and, and you know, just like, you know, you can get a copy of today's presentation, but at this point in time, information a month from now, the precautions, you know, what is in place and what isn't in place could change. So, you know, we've got, you know, the, the color coding of areas, um, the lockdown or not lockdown, the, the independence of individual public health units to write their own uh, orders specific to that region. Um, so it's one of the things that employers have been struggling with is just trying to, you know, you're trying to run your business, but at the same time, you're trying to keep a finger on all these different uh, avenues of information to, to maintain current. Um, so the key is, you know, just maintaining um, the uh, main, uh, monitoring the public health information, uh, monitoring the uh, the various Ontario websites uh, specific to coronavirus, um, so that you are staying current. You know, for example, now folks that were in lockdown or in certain regions are going back to the green zone, right? So, what does that really mean, and uh, which particular sector individual employers fall into? So, it, it has been a challenge um, for everyone, um, and you know, that is the biggest concern that I've heard from. From workplace parties from employers any other last minute questions um we were also interested in, in maybe putting a poll up uh for uh, everybody to see whether there's interest in in trying to bring together oh here it is i guess there's interest to, to uh bring together a, a or um book a service canada uh staff person to speak uh around their uh inspections um so if, if there is interest please let us know here through this poll um, at the side of the screen. Um, I, I was able to connect to the presentation that Ron did with that also had a Service Canada speaker and it was it was great because you could really um, you know get a, a bigger picture around uh, around all of the inspections that are taking place as well. So let us know if if, uh, if you all would find that as a as a worthwhile um, uh, event I guess that we can organize and a webinar that we can put together. Yeah so I think that's pretty much uh, all the questions right now that we have. I'm not sure if we want to just quickly open up to any, any last, oh, sorry. So the poll came in, uh, looks like there is interest uh, to have this event. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll definitely work on, uh, on that for the future. And I think that's a role that uh, Oak, how we want to really uh, start uh, playing around, you know, being able to pull specifically oc oc occupational health, uh, you know, information and sharing it in the most accessible ways to groups and uh, and support organizations and service organizations, because I think it's definitely clear with COVID-19 that there's, you know, everybody has a role to play and, and you know, whether it's the health units uh, uh, and so really having everybody aware of occupational health and safety and what's happening is, is you know, putting the pieces to, to this complicated puzzle, I guess, together. I just make a suggestion in regard to Service Canada. I really believe that it will be a good thing to have a presentation from them. But I wonder if before the presentation, and, and if it will be good for us to learn more about what is legally and uh, federally speaking, what is the role of Service Canada in regard to the program? But by knowing the responsibilities, then we can maybe focus more our interest in those some areas that we know that they respond to. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's a good. That's a. That's a good point. I think if there's interest with Service Canada, I think there is actually a Service Canada 
person on here, but I don't want to put the person on the spot. They might, uh, you know, it's never, it's never uh, necessarily clear and they didn't agree to, uh, you know, to speak, but I think, you know, we can kind of pull together some service Canada information and reach out to service Canada. We have some contacts as well. Um, and maybe, you know, together with, with sending out uh, information for a webinar, if that is something that service Canada can help us with, uh, we can send out information to <coughs> provide some, inf you know, some, a better understanding around their role so that when the webinar then uh, is, uh, the day of the webinar, then, then you know, folks are coming with with a, a good understanding to, to be able to then jump into that. That's a, that's a great uh, suggestion. Other general comments. I think uh, the, the microphones are all on. <laughs> not. Let me just check the chat one last time. And if not, then I think that's the end of our event. And uh, thank you so much, Ron, for for joining us and putting the time to explain um, a lot of information. Um, and if there's any questions or follow up, I, I know. We covered a lot, and there's a lot that, you know, with COVID-19, there's always things that we're still understanding, we're still trying to figure out, and then even more so around ensuring that workers are, are you know, getting the, 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 this information in clear ways. So definitely reach out to us, uh, anybody that, that is interested in, in speaking more about, about this, uh, any, any of these topics, and we can, you know, connect to adequate uh, agencies that might have the answers and start courting that or or also just work directly with you as well but thank you very much to everybody and